It's uh, the afternoon, so I hope everyone's had their coffee. Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right, and that's up there. So, um, so welcome. Thank you for attending this session. Um, my name is Ben Piscopo. I'm a learning designer at edX. And while my title is learning designer, a lot of what I do uh, throughout the week is actually consulting with edX partners who are thinking about how to scale the learning that takes place in classrooms or in small online sessions and make it, you know, MOOC, MOOC worthy. Um, so it's exciting uh, work and I enjoy it. And um, it's also, you know, part of the reason I'm happy to share with you a little bit about to use learning experience frame framework with you today. Um, you know, part of the learning design work that, that I do is the practical side. Um, I find that when I share examples with partners, they really value that, you know, you have examples and you can um, point to some inspiration. Uh, and I feel like that's, you know, part of the framework, which includes the feel part of learning, the, you know, the emotive connection to learning um, is part of that, of why inspiration can really help uh, faculty and other course builders create the best courses possible. So this is the world, this is the nerdy world that I enjoy living in. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so as you might already know, and actually Anant st uh, stole some of my thunder, <laughs> um, you know, edX was founded in 2012 by Harvard and MIT to expand access to quality education to everyone everywhere. And over the past decade, we've brought innovative programs to the world with nearly 200 academic, corporate, and nation partners. And last November, edX was acquired by 2U, a leader in online program management. Um, and you got a little introduction earlier. And so the combination has really brought together the unique strengths of edX and 2U, these capabilities uh, from two major forces in online learning. Also, God, this was spoiled earlier, but um, now that we're together, edX and 2U have formed a massive education marketplace, um, which is really, an, I think, an, an appropriate way to describe edX.org uh, today. Um, it serves 43 million learners, and there are over 230 partners now, uh, which is pretty wild. Um, there's only one of me, so I, it's, I get pulled in a lot of directions. So in, in order to enable partners, we also need to find ways to scale that support. Uh, and so that's also part of, of what I do. Um, there's no way I could review thousands and thousands of, of courses to ensure uh, their quality. So we make sure that our partners are well-versed in, um, in learning design and the, um, the current research. So um, this portfolio spans from free to degree, as you heard earlier, um, from uh, alternative credentials to degrees. And um, how about I move along here? <laughs> so now that you've, you've got a sense of what 2U and edX do, or can offer together, uh, I'd like to actually shift our focus um, to how we optimize learning experiences across the platform and catalog of thousands of courses, right? So if there are any edX partners in the room, I see a few of you guys. Um, you may recognize this slide. For years, edX has developed its own guidance um, for partners to develop learning experiences based on solid research. Thank you, Spence. Um, and these and other strategies have been an entry point for partners, right? And especially for educators who are new to some of the modern pedagogy uh, necessary to take online learning to the next level. And most of the time, partners tell us that they're bringing these ideas back to their institutions. Um, and, um, you know, based on some of the strategies we share during our partner orientation uh, events. Um, and this is where my team is happy to share this guidance. Like I said, everyone loves examples, and we'll, we'll talk about those shortly. edX has also accumulated a trove of data that tells us how learners are engaging uh, with our courses. Um, and this has not only informed uh, platform and product decisions, but it's also supported our team's course-specific rec recommendations for I iterative improvements, right? So in some cases, we'll, we will review uh, courses um, to help partners decide, you know, how could we do this better? Uh, now that we're part of 2U, this guidance does not go away, but rather it finds a new home in 2U's learning experience framework, which is what we're going to talk about today. 
Um, so for a bit of background on this, uh, in 2020, we all remember 2020, uh, the 2U Learning Design and Development Team actually found itself facing some new challenges, as many of us did that year. Um, and their 10-month development cycle for building high-quality digital learning experiences was condensed to 10 weeks. So you can imagine what that might be like. Um, and so this model uh, became known as 2UOS Essential. And the LXF was one piece of this model. The LXF is a collection of research-based principles drawn from the learning sciences that's uh, used a theoretical, as a theoretical underpinning for our work. The principles themselves are not new, necessarily, but they're part of a shared model of online education and infused with best practices um, and application examples drawn from our extensive experience. So for 2U and edX, the LXF provides like a shared language uh, and reference for our work, both internally uh, for course and content development that happens at 2U. There's dozens, and there are actually hundreds of people in the 2U learning design uh, group, whereas at edX, we've, we have two. Uh, so there's a big difference there, but in terms of uh, using the LXF, um, to you uses this internally, we have started using this internally, um, and it really represents like a f our philosophy on what makes for good learning, right? And so what is the philosophy? It can be summed up in three words, feel, do, think. It's a bit of an oversimplification of it, but it's one way to kind of remember this. Um, so this approach is built around the science-supported ideas that learners learn best when they're doing, when they're thinking about what they're doing, and that feelings, attitudes, and beliefs can have a significant impact on the process of learning. So for the learning designers and researchers in the room, this might not be new for you, but uh, a lot of folks uh, you know, are new to learning design and every, every day picking up new uh, tips and techniques. So collectively, Feel do think represent the three learner focused dimensions that we seek to address and be mindful of in designing and developing learning experiences. So let's dive into each dimension a little bit, and uh, I'll provide you some examples from edX courses, whereas my 2U colleagues might reference 2U courses, uh, and that's totally fine. Um, all right. So, first one here, feel, addresses the emotive aspects of learning. So in this category, we have principles that reference things like intrinsic motivation, mastery goals, self-regulation, and growth mindset. There are a lot of ways that we can address these things in online learning, uh, and I would say feel is probably the most important because it leads to sustained effort toward goals, right? Um, now, you may have heard this rumor going around that online learning uh, can suffer from poor retention rates, right? Uh, and students can feel isolated, they could struggle, they could get bored or distracted, um, and they can lose motivation, perhaps, to return to the next class. Um, and at the end, they may quit. But if we don't find a way to support motivation online, students could struggle to develop it naturally. In fact, the conversation earlier about supporting learners is, is key to this. Um, it needs to take into consideration these aspects around this field dimension. Um, so yeah, spending money is, is, uh, is one way to, to, for, for learners to be motivated. They want to get what they've paid for and stay committed, but we can't just rest on our laurels and expect um, the investment motivation to be the thing that drives learners. So let's take a look at um, uh, an edX example, conjure, see how we might conjure up motivation in learners. So you see in this example, um, if you've ever searched for how to author a course in edX Studio, you'll probably see this at the top of your results. Uh, this is Studio X, and I was lucky enough to be part of its reboot a few years ago. And uh, we were trying to instill a sense of obligation in course authors through the steps to add, um, sorry, we're trying to um, instill a sense of obligation in course authors to provide ample support for disabled learners. Um, which I would say there's different levels of advocacy for uh, disabled learners around the world. 
or even regionally or culturally, uh, what, whatever the norms may be, uh, can differ. So instead of just walking course authors through the steps to add alt text to images or import uh, a caption file in Studio, we wanted to take a moment to transport them. And hopefully they see the world through a different lens, which is what this does. So in this experience, learners are asked to watch a short film called The Interviewer. How many of you have seen this video before or watched it? That's OK. Yeah, maybe one or two. Great, actually. Uh, I can't wait for you to watch it for your first time. Um, so in this film, uh, a candidate enters a law firm expecting to be interviewed. And while he's waiting to be called on, a professional-looking man with Down syndrome collects him and invites him into his office for a very interesting first impression. I won't give away the ending, because I think everyone should watch this short film at least once. But I can say that the candidate is in for a delightful surprise. Now, separate from the plot, the video is natively captioned with text and audio descriptions. And while the audio descriptions are, are playing, course authors are asked to close their eyes and imagine being a vision-impaired learner for like 10 seconds and see how it makes you feel. By taking 10 seconds to close your eyes and just listen, you naturally develop a, a, a form of empathy for those who are differently abled. And I think that's incredibly important for all of us um, as we're designing and building courses. Now, authoring in an LMS could seem like a pretty straightforward task without much excitement, uh, but many courses in different fields can make a connection with their target audience in similar related ways. And while there's definitely risk of going too far down a rabbit hole, so something we might call seductive details or extraneous cognitive load, there's tremendous value when it aligns with the learning objectives in the course. Thank you. I like, I, I, I got an extra point. I'm being, gra I'm being graded while I, <laughs> all right, so that was feel. Now to do. So this category is all about active learning, as you might imagine. And um, we have principles that guide us not only in what the student learns, but also how they learn it. Uh, this list of principles is longer because there's just so many benefits to the to learning experiences that you might design using them. Big picture, it keeps us focused on centering active, applied practice opportunities while designing effective instructional content to support that practice. So it includes things like teaching using stories and examples, designing authentic pra practice activities, and incorporating desirable difficulties into coursework, which supports better learning. So let's take a look at uh, an example um, from a University System of Maryland. Uh, the, uh, the Smith Business School has produced an amazing course and uh, is also one that I like to share with, uh, with folks who might be new to learning design or are looking for more inspiration. So, um, you know, from this example, we have a number of strategies that you're going to see. Um, and keep in mind that feel, do, think are not meant to be applied linearly in your designs. So this example I'm about to show you, in this example, you'll, you'll see evidence of feel and think across the learning sequence. So this would be, on edX, considered one learning sequence, a series of pages that really fold into a lesson. Um, so you're going to see feel, do, think in different ways at different times, and that's totally OK. Um, we'll revisit the overlapping relationship of these things uh, toward the end of the presentation. So on this screenshot alone, you can already see a nicely structured navigation that prompts learners to do certain things, like now it's time to learn. Now you're going to watch this thing, um, and you're going to do other things. Um, in fact, why don't I open this up and just show you the module live, right? So we have, um, you know, a structure that's being used across this lesson that starts with learn. Then once you've learned, you move into practice. And then once you've had a chance to practice what you've learned, you're given a novel context, a new situation in which you can apply the things that you've learned and practiced. Uh, so this structure is really helpful for, for learners and it gives them like a sense of where they're at. So there's metacognitive benefits to this. Um, all right, 
So now, for this course, so imagine you're taking this course as a learner. It's about marketing management. This lesson is about um, the, this sort of like three-pronged marketing strategy that they're teaching. And what they've decided to do is chunk segmentation and targeting separate from this third item, positioning. So the, um, the faculty member has a short lecture about segmentation and targeting and then introduces positioning. Provides a lecture for this, so I'm going to move through the lesson, but you can always, you know, learn it for yourself later if you'd like. Um, and once, that, once that's done, you can then, you're asked to recall. So this is a standard best practice on edX, which is to provide like a knowledge check. So you've got a series of, of, of questions that definitely help with, you know, lower level, like remember level, understand level. And this course follows the, the, these wonderful uh, best practices. So once you've done that from the learn stage, you're then prompted to practice. So um, in, in this case, you know, you're going to practice thinking about how to position a product for a target segment. Um, and so you're prompted to develop a new energy drink. right? So who are your customers going to be for this energy drink? Um, and then this continues, you know, you have this prompt in which learners are asked to um, post in the discussion, but then also read through like a dozen other posts. Read what your classmates are posting about their energy drink idea, and then, you know, provide a suggestion or a comment that could be useful to your classmate, right? So it's not just post once, comment twice. There's actually a little bit more in this discussion prompt uh, that can... Uh, cause learners to participate a little more. And you're also um, prompted to vote for the ideas that you find to be more effective. So there's a lot of value in that, especially for learners coming, coming back who want to see what the votes have tallied up to. Um, so, so what you've seen so far is like the navigation that helps a learner figure out where they are in a lesson. Um, there's practice in context in this energy drink example. And then after this learn and practice, this team decided, well, let's do a separate learn and practice for this next item called positioning, or the positioning statement, which is actually a skill where you're learning to craft a statement here um, that identifies, you know, I think it actually identifies your um, your target audience and how your how your product solves their needs. Um, and so, writing a positioning statement is challenging. It's like if you're n if you start a new business or a company and you're asked to write the mission statement or the vision statement. These things are not easy to come up with and and, and take a lot of revision and iterations. But essentially, what this uh, part of the lesson does is is ask you like, what's your experience doing this? And it also gives you an idea of what your classmates' experience is like by simply polling whether or not you have experience writing this kind of statement. Then you're prompted to watch an actual positioning statement be formed. This one's related to the, the, the DeWalt company. And once you've learned, you then practice, right? You see this, this um, structure repeating. And then there's some scaffolding benefit here for those who are new to writing positioning statements in which you really like, you hug the, the guardrails in real tight um, so that a learner can sort of form their statement um, in a way that is like, okay, so I've actually created a positioning statement that is good enough, right? Um, so once you've done that, you've sort of, you've scaffolded this and then you practice it in this discussion. Right. So now you're going to write your positioning statement for your energy drink. And I think, yes, so that's, that's the bottom of, of practice. Now we're in that third phase of this lesson structure, apply. And since this is a business school, there's a lot of you know, case studies. And so there are different ways to execute a case study within like your learning design. Um, and so I would say it might it might be tempting to just send everyone a PDF 
Go read the PDF. But actually, um, what um, the Smith School has done has introduced the JCPenney crisis, uh, in which a, a big retailer in America called JCPenney, they've been around for over 100 years, um, runs in into some issues, uh, especially as times changed in the 2000s. You can imagine old school retailers having to deal with Amazon and the like of them. Um, so what they've done is developed a, um, an interactive block. I think it's Articulate Storyline. They just embedded this in, and you can learn about the JCPenney identity crisis and the issues that they faced. And you can move through, learn the history, the issue, the timeline, and then there's like a quick knowledge check in there. So I love this because it carries the learner through, gives them a little recall activity so that they can then um, continue to move through the case study. Middle class moms, maybe? Correct. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I read this a little bit, of course. Um, and then you, you progress, right? And this was the CEO, Ron Johnson, who was brought on to solve their issue. Um, but he doesn't succeed. So, uh, you know, case there has to be drama in the case study. So, anyway, you can continue to read through, and um, there's more knowledge checks along the way. But it's just a great way to sort of repackage a case study and make it a little more interactive than, say, reading a PDF. As you might expect here, you're prompted um, to list the three biggest mistakes that Ron Johnson made uh, and then have this discussion with your classmates. Last item here um, that I want to mention here has to do with reflection. So learners are asked to, you know, after you've hypothesized or identified the mistakes and discussed them with your peers, it's time to reflect on that experience, right? So we're not just ending at a discussion and that's it. We're taking a little bit of time here to reflect. Um, and at the very end, this lesson sort of connects this with, um, with prior knowledge by wrapping up the case and connecting it to the five C's, right? Um, and then you're, you're given solutions. What did Ron Johnson do, right? Um, I'd say that you know, summarizing the challenges and the potential solutions after learners have had a chance to do that on their own can be really valuable. Um, and a final wrap-up video um, provides the results of the actions taken by the company. Um, I compare this to, to um, the deliberate practice technique in which, um, s you know, which we do for scaled learning experiences. So it ends with an expert's take on a situation or maybe common misconceptions that learners tend to have about the topic. And then you've got this expert advice that's being provided to, to everyone. So sometimes I do get questions about, you know, we want the, the subject matter expert or the faculty member to provide like one-to-one -one feedback. And since you can't do that in a course with thousands of students, um, the resources are just not there. In fact, this brings us back to the talk earlier, like how do we get to the promised land? Well, a step in that direction is actually to have an expert summarize some of those misconceptions um, so that you can sort of anticipate where most learners who, have, who run into issues may, might be at. It doesn't cover all situations, and it should also be you know, um, a manageable length video um, or, or uh, expert feedback. So it's kind of generic expert feedback, you might, you might say. Um, and so there's some of that used here. Um, so anyway, this is the very end of the lesson. And you can tell like, a lot of effort went into this. Um, you need to have a team, right? You've got to s you have to support um, the design and connect them to the learning objectives. All right, it's just my favorite example, and I, <laughs> and I love to share that one with folks. All right, so the last part of Feel, Do, Think is think. And this refers to the idea that students benefit from getting input in the processes of learning, whether that be input from the instructor, their peers, or even themselves. Um, so in this category, we have principles about formative feedback, social processing, and metacognition. Now in that case-based lesson we just talked about, or looked, looked through, um, there were moments that fell in this category. I even commented on them. 
but did you notice what they were? This is something I want to ask you. So did you notice think moments in that lesson? Yeah. They are prompting you to think about what, what Ron Johnson did wrong. Sure. Yep. Reflections are big. Yeah. Yeah, that reflection, especially for yourself and especially to scale the learning. Self-reflections can be really, really valuable here. I mean, it's, they're great for learning anyway. Um, there's another metacognitive benefit in the design of the lesson. Remember when it said, like, learn and now watch, now recall, now discuss. And they even have their own uh, iconography and images that support providing these steps and stages for learners, right? So they don't just enter the lesson and just, okay, so where am I at? What am I supposed to do? It's just a topic and I'm watching a video, but where, where are we going with that? Um, so providing that is quite subtle, but there are metacognitive benefits to that. All right. So. Now I do have an example here um, from my colleagues at Delft. Thank you, Delft. Am I allowed to use this? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I've got permission now. So um, <laughs> in Rethink the City, uh, TU Delft brings learners on a journey to learn about urban challenges in the global south. And so one topic in particular is on spatial justice, which is a field that exists at the intersection of social, social justice and social injustice. Um, so we're looking for examples uh, here. So this module also asks the question of whether it's possible to observe how resources are fairly or unfairly distributed in a city. Now, once the photos of the examples have been taken, learners upload them to Sketch Drive, which is a tool you guys are using. Um, it's a tool that's used to share visual work in online courses. This is also where learners are asked to review their peers' photos and provide feedback. So, so far, in th this example incorporates like a meaningful social learning component with feedback or formative feedback. It was actually really fascinating to see learners from all over the world just share photos from their neighborhood or down the street from their house and just kind of like analyze what's happening. And while live synchronous conference calls are a good opportunity to, um, for interactive discussion and group work, depending on the size of the enrollment, um, live calls aren't always the best solution for, for uh, global learners to collaborate, right? So students may be scattered across different time zones. They might not have reliable access to internet or a computer, like a really good question in the, uh, in, in the talk uh, in the middle of the day is about learners that just don't have access to internet or have spotty connections. What do we do for them? How do we support them? Um, and they might not be able to show up at a scheduled time every week. So if we have this learner-centered uh, focus on the issue, um, we need to think carefully about how to get students to work with each other outside of synchronous calls. And so in smaller classes, you could actually ask learners to meet up in a variety of ways uh, that work for them. Uh, they could form a study group or a, you know, a group together on Slack or WhatsApp. And these are opportunities uh, for learners to build relationships in their class and learn from each other outside of discussion forums. So that brings us to the end of this tour uh, of the learning experience framework. And there's just so much that we could talk about because there's just so many valuable items in each one of these dimensions. So um, you could spend like an entire degree learning, learning them. Um, and I can't, un I can't overstate how intertwined these categories can really be within a solid learning experience, as you've seen. Uh, they definitely overlap, and, uh, and some principles may apply to more than one category. So for instance, a knowledge check or a short quiz is a form of active learning, or do, which is sufficient for remembering concepts. But, it's al but it also provides automated feedback, which we've listed here under think. The critical message here is that these categories are not walled off from each other, right? So there's a fluid use happening here. Now, sometimes le online learning can be 
derided as being not as good as in-person or synchronous education, but it's important to keep reminding ourselves that in many cases what happened in 2020, like in, re in reaction to a pandemic, was not really designed for online education. But we've seen from those polls earlier today that we've powered through it and that there are indeed ways in which you can make online learning really impactful. And hopefully these examples help with that. You know, high quality online education takes a lot of time and resources, uh, but meaningful, memorable, and motivational learning experiences are totally worth the effort. And when we design intentionally and leverage various systems and tools along with applying the principles from this framework, the result is high quality learning. And it's what gets me up out of bed in the morning. Uh, and if you have the resources necessary to realize these kinds of designs, then learners will show their appreciation for it. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we can take some questions. Or Thank you. Thank you for your incredible presentation. Oh, um, my question was, the thing I'm struggling with is that uh, there are two types of learners in general. Uh, some who love to attend a course and have communication live, communication uh, with other students and with the tutor or teacher or the instructor, like my wife. And uh, people like me who are self-educating and uh, they like to yeah, be f more free and uh, discover and explore by themselves and learn. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to a situation that everybody have has to take online lessons, let's say, or uh, as we saw in <laughs> statistics that they are mostly preferred to do that, in to do this uh, online, what is pedagogically speaking what what uh, we can do about those people who have trouble with online education right thank you for the question yeah so uh, i like to think like from 10,000 feet the key is flexibility flexibility in the options that you provide learners that's what's so great about being able to provide like um, maybe a higher touch experience for those that can meet in person or can form a study group online and be more engaged with their classmates. But then you also have the option of staying in the, in the course, perhaps more independent study and focusing on your learning that way. Um, I think that both, I, I actually, sometimes I'm both of those <laughs> learners in one and I think a lot of us might, might be that way. Um, so being able to have the option um, to be able to complete your, your work and even do it quickly, right, without locking down modules that, that come later in the course, but because you've moved ahead and you're, you've you're self-studying or you have, a, you have a, you know, a whole weekend in which you want to focus on your course, you should be able to, to move faster than the pace. But it is helpful for most learners to be able to know how much time this should take me so that I can plan accordingly, right? So in this example, time management, um, by not locking down modules in your course, you allow that flexibility. And so that's one example of providing flexibility to learners. And there's, there's a lot more. Did you want to follow up? Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, those people who like, who, who doesn't like, um, mm, other people <laughs> no <laughs> online edu online education let's yeah. say they 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 claim they that they have a problem with learning process i mean they don't learn that way because they prefer to communicate mm -hmm. so they learn through communication mm -hmm. through attending uh, courses being in a place a different place from their home especially moms oh, okay. huh? so um i, I think that um, I mean, following of uh, what you said about flexibility, but I think yeah. also there is some something, a very very big lack in uh, open edX that I don't know what is its future, but is the interface and the environment that the student is there, is it is not abs is absolutely unattractive. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, from this point of view of those students, I would say that maybe mm, methods like gamifications or a little a little bit, not a little bit, uh, a revolutionary change of interface, I mean, the environment of learning mm-hmm. could help a lot those people to have a very uh, good experience of learning. So to switch from that uh, pattern that uh, they are used to, to an online education, which is mm-hmm. more productive. Can be. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, what, what you're asking about with regard to connecting with other humans in person and preferring to go to a location for that interaction, that engagement, um, there should be options made available. I know that we, you know, we have colleagues at um, P2PU, um, it's a nonprofit organization that helps organize study circles or learning circles, I think they're called. And these can happen all over the world. And so if you, um, if you're designing a course and you want to provide, you know, provide some more support for learners that need, uh, need or want or desire to, uh, to meet in person, then I think providing an, an option where learners can gather, and you do have like a learning circle leader who helps facilitate conversation and provide, um, you know, a place for learners to, to talk and share and learn um, and even challenge each other's ideas, that's possible. Um, and, it, and it is an option that's available. It just takes, you know, a, a motivated learner to, to, to set that up. Because if we have a course with thousands of learners from all over the globe, it's just impossible for uh, an instructor or a designer to actually set those up in like the top 12 cities or, or whatever strategy they choose to use. Um, it ends up having to be those who are motivated to do it. They, c- they go out and then they form a, form a group. So that would just be one example that I would use that can help support uh, learning in a MOOC. Yeah, sure. Uh, I saw another hand over here. Sure. Thank you, thank you for sharing your ideas. And um, my question is about uh, your experience uh, with the subject uh, matter experts. Because um, in my experience, uh, we know that this framework, uh, in particular in the second uh, example from uh, Maryland, I think uh, university, yes. You remind me the Bloom's taxonomy uh, mm, ideas process. Uh, and I know it's uh, very important uh, to follow this process. I try to follow this process when uh, I uh, design the courses, but uh, for me it's very difficult to <coughs> convince <laughs> the <laughs> expert uh, of the importance of this process. Um, and uh, this should be very difficult uh, to go ahead and to convince them that uh, uh, this is very important to uh, to have a, uh, a good process, but uh, um, above all, uh, a good experience for learners, the, mm-hmm. the success. So yeah. what is your experience <laughs> in, in this like case? How do we convince subject matter experts or faculty with that we might be working with that this is important work that we're doing with them, right? And... Uh, that it's not a waste of time <laughs> and all these other yeah. things, right? Um, I've, I've had lovely conversations uh, with SMEs and not great ones. And I think those in the field have experienced that. Um, so how do you convince them? Well, I think, you, you, I, I think it's important to have some kind of relationship with the person. I mean, I think that that goes for any situation in which you're trying to convince someone of your ideas. Um, they're not like required to, like they may be invited and asked to participate or to, to contribute to your project, but they're not like required to make it easy for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think part of the buy-in is like, it has to do with like what's the most relevant, what are the relevant set of knowledge and skills that learners need? Um, you don't always have to go into like you don't have to open, open the hood and explore the entire engine with someone who's not a mechanic or not an expertise in the engine, but they have their expertise that they can contribute to. So I feel like if you can limit 
the amount of additional explanation that has to happen. Like they can focus on the subject. And like they can focus on the subject, and you can focus on the learner. And you want them to uh, advocate for the learner too, but that's not always the case. And you might not be able to, to convince them of that. Um, there might be other folks in the room that have worked with SMEs recently who, who might want to share a point or two that, that they have. I'd like to inv invite someone to share what, what they've done. Um, hi, it's a really great question. I think um, as instructional designers, it's something that we all um, kind of struggle with. Like the biggest challenge you have is getting your SME to be on board, right? Um, I have found that, um, as you said, Ben, um, creating rapport at the beginning is so important. Um, and I, I've often found that what the, uh, it's very important to try and figure out what is the actual concern, because they might be saying, oh, this is a waste of time, I don't I'm too busy for this, but perhaps what they're actually worried about is maybe loss of the um, academic material, or maybe they're um, worried that um, somehow the essence of the course is going to be lost when it's taken online. Um, and so I think there's like a process of discovery and just like um, figuring out like what, what, is, what is your problem actually, or what is your actual concern, or what are the things that you are like really worried about, and then using that as like a baseline and, and building from there. So maybe if they're concerned like, um, by taking my course online, students are not going to be able to hear my one-liners and my jokes. <laughs> um, and I've had, I've had that. That's <laughs> oh, that's a real yeah, example. I've, like I had a faculty member say, like, you know, I, I have a great relationship with, with my students, and if they're just going to be doing readings and all of this, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. um, what's going to happen? Like, they were concerned about that. Um, and so my response was then, look, Obviously, we don't want you online students to miss out on the essence and like the just how exciting your course is. So let's see how we can bring your faculty-isms or um, <laughs> into, <laughs> I didn't want to say the actual faculty's name, but I was like, say it was Ben, your sure. Ben-isms ben into your <laughs> course. <laughs> and, and there's various ways that you can do that. So I think it's a, just a, um, a process of starting from the beginning, like what, if they expressing concern, th like um, in negotiation, you would call it the black swan. It's like the, th the thing that's underneath everything else is like what is the actual, uh, the hidden, the hidden meaning behind it. I don't know if that helps, but yeah. That's great, great example. Yep. So, sure. Um, maybe just just adding to that, I think what helps us is bringing the actual SMEs in the same room or Zoom room with your learners. Because um, the same way as you saying build a relationship to your SMEs, build a relationship between individual learners and your subject matter experts. And they will invest more time and more energy uh, because they know that their material um, is being delivered in a, in a better way. That sounds like empathy building for the SME or the instructor or whomever, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had an experience with that, uh, that uh, if you can y y ask one of these subject matter experts to take care of negotiation with other subject matter experts, mm -hmm. it usually goes good because they understand each other better and we when one of them is on board, then y you easily can convince others to contribute. It's another great uh, tactic Act and um, you may develop like a set of champions who just embrace the whole idea and are just very participatory in the in the uh, in this in the the way you do it um, who can then connect at that collegial level that might not be the same way that they look at us as learning designers yeah so that's that's fantastic Jenny do you have sure to actually piggyback off what y'all are saying, um, we've actually developed a program that gets subject matter experts to work collaboratively to design a module. So that helps a lot in getting, you know, the completion rates up for the modules and getting them on board with, you know, providing the effective pedagogies that we support and that we promote. Um, 
And another thing I found that really helps is that um, we would enroll these SMEs in, uh, in cohorts. So once every year we would enroll like a dozen or so and um, guide them through an, an intense workshop and hackathon that lasted about you know seven to nine days, but at the end of that seven to nine days it was done. You know, and they had a partner to work with, so they were overcoming the fear of like, I can't learn a new technology, or I don't have time for this. And when they worked together, they got it done. Awesome. These are really great comments, and it's also like the power of social learning in action here. So yes, I love when it's like super meta that way. Um, we, we have to leave it there, so thank you again very much.